So now, in QR factorization, how does Gram Schmidt method help? also in doing it. Now what we actually do is that we take A which is equal to V1, V2, Vn and what we do is that we do each row operation either directly or by steps, steps on steps. So for example, if we do directly, then what will we do? First of all, we will scale in the first one, for example, 1 upon R11, because V1 upon absolute value of V1 is what happens in the first case, is equal to A1. Then in second case, what do we do? V2, A2 is equal to V2 minus some uh, factor, let me call that factor as uh, R12, ok, so let me call that factor R12 and uh, this will be, what will it be divided by? This R12 times V1 and this whole thing, uh, I will divide it by this absolute value of it, let me tell it R22. Is it so? So in that way, I am trying to keep, I am trying to do this stuff. For example for this, 1 upon, so V1 whole matrix is multiplied by V1, all the elements are getting multiplied by V, this this is multiplied by this, this is multiplied by this, this is multiplied by this. In the second case, it is getting multiplied by this, this whole row is getting multiplied by this. So, in that way, we are getting a triangular matrix in this case. So, when we get a r is equal to q, we can also write A is equal to QR inverse because its all diagonal elements are not equal to 0. So in that sense A is equal to QR inverse and that is why we get this gram schmidt orthogonalization process helps. We can have an algorithm, a formal algorithm which you can study. So this is so by now we have understood how we do QR factorization, how the Brown Schmidt orthogonalization process works, and that to this unstable version. We will understand why this is unstable in this lecture only. First of all, can we actually do Brown uh, this? Uh, can we actually find QR factorization for any matrix? Can we find such for any matrix? Answer is yes, we can. And second question which comes is that can this, uh, uh, will this QR factorization be unique or not? It depends on whether the A is singular or not. So let us first dig into some theorems, standard theorems. Theorem number 1 states that for every A there is a QR factorization. Okay for every A, ok? And that is the theorem 2 states that this QR factorization is unique for a non-singular matrix, singular, ok? Or uh, <coughs> Uh, similarly, uh, so this is how, or if, if we if we have uh, not a square matrix, then we can say 
that if the vectors are independent are independent then also we can then we can get a unique qr why so and here a belongs to c this complex m cross n so everywhere m is dimension of column vector each column vector so so v1 will have 0 to m minus 1 elements this is the way we represent this matrix okay so a belongs to cm where m is rows and columns so now we got this point what a what what is this uh, but how let's first understand I mean just think case one A is single or is not zero or it is singular non singular sir. So if it is not singular then it is simple enough we can use gram schmidt orthogonalization as in previous lecture because there are n independent vectors and therefore uh, if we see then the column space is e uh, column space is equal to the rank assume that m is greater than n okay so uh, column space is equal to the rank but if column space is less than rank uh, is sorry the rank is less than column space then what can we say that there are one or two some vectors which actually form which go to nullity or null space in a sense that the dimension of uh, and you by you must if you study this uh, linear basic linear algebra then you must know one very important for uh, theorem fundamental theorem that is dimension of uh, column space is equal to dimension of uh, uh, null space plus rank you must understand this because uh, this this is a very fundamental theorem which you must know if you have studied basic linear algebra so if the rank is equal to column uh, column space then we don't have any problem anyways we are getting any independent vectors but if the rank is not equal to the column space then we have to have accommodate certain zeros and whenever we are getting null space then uh, we can always uh, have some sort of vectors for example let me give you an example what I am trying to say if I take a projection of three dimension to two dimension. Okay. Okay. Let me take four dimension to two dimensions. Okay. So if I go from 4D to 2D, if this vector is x, y, z, w, then here only what I get is just simply x, y, 0, 0. So what is the, this is so the what what I am trying to say, this is what will be the the rank for this will be two, and some things all zero zero y z forms will go to null space. 
Are you trying to get what I'm trying to say? Like, because this this all wiser will do, and we can have very different types of bases for this yz. So if you are getting something which goes to null space, then you never ever have a unique way of determining what is the basis of a null space. You cannot, let me write it down, because these are some things where we get stuck on them and we don't know what actually means. That for a null space with some dimension, let me tell greater than one at least specifically then you can't capital can't find unique vectors as basis of it in the gram schmidt process because how can you how can you find out a unique sort of basis for null space just think of it intuitively you cannot and therefore whenever it is non singular then what we do we just add some uh, sort of we, we if if it is not singular then what we do is that uh, we add some more vectors which go to zero and we add something they are not unique at all okay so if this is a1, a2, an, then we add am. If let me take ak and ak plus one to an. So we add this vectors which go to uh, null space. So in sense this uh, in this q, this q matrix. So if I do q q star or something like this, this will always go to zero. This will have to go to zero. So such vectors which go to zero, they are not unique. But this portion is unique. In sense, so in that sense, whenever it is singular or whenever its determinant is 0 or whenever it has different linearly independent uh, wherever it doesn't have the rank equal to the column space then we have a non-unique form of QR representation but in any form we always have some or other form of QR factorization method applicable for all matrices so we get this now we move to how can we determine like let us try to find uh, uh, dig, dig deep into what is Gram Schmidt orthogonal Schmidt orthogonal process okay. now I told you in the previous class about the unstable version of it And, but I didn't mention to you how we get QR matrix from it. It is simple enough because we are getting this uh, these all set of vectors A1 or whatever I got A1 to A N, and I am getting the projections or the components and that components actually we can write it in a matrix form which will form R and this will form Q. So in that way we can deduce a QR matrix form for this through Gram Schmidt process. Uh, orthogonalization, I always keep writing in it, always takes too much space and big, big tongue twister sort of. Unstable thing. And there is also something, some form of a stable version. Now, why it is stable and why this is unstable? We can compare when uh, we can know when, uh, when we know this method well. So what is the difference between this unstable and stable version? First, in unstable version, what do we do? If this is V1 and V2, let me take just two vectors, uh, three vectors, okay, and V3. 
in this I separate I just I just remove this part of it and just obtain this a1 a1 is from b1 only a2 I get from subtracting this and a3 I get from subtracting this portion and this portion this is how we do uh, this unstable portion but remember one thing in unstable version we are always operating on we are always obtaining this A3 from B1 and B2 B1 and B2 may be very close enough so this actually if they are not orthogonal by itself because there is something in uh, mathematics if you, if you see the how actually things happen they don't happen by unstable way because whenever things are not orthogonal there may be something called rounding errors so there may be rounding errors and so to prevent this rounding errors what we do is that we first calculate a1 and a2 and we apply this A3, this, uh, uh, this component method on this previously obtained A1 and A2 in this table world. Whenever we obtain this projections on the previously obtained method, then it is stable version because they are already orthogonal, so the rounding error will get reduced. While in the unstable method, we are trying to obtain the component on basis of non-orthogonal previous values, which will create some sort of a rounding error. So here, what will we do? First, this is V1, say A1, we got from V1, we got A1 from V1, and we got V2, this A2. Now, we don't try to find projections on V1 and V2, like we found earlier. We do this same on A1 and A2, I'm sorry. We do the same on A1 and A2 to obtain A3. So this is a sort of a, what we tell, Mm. Uh, uh, a sort of constantly updated like we have to do it iteratively and this can be done parallelly but introduces errors why can we do it parallelly because uh, we don't we don't need because why why can we happen parallelly because we for obtaining a3 i do not require a2 a2 is not required a1 is not required for a3 we just require v1 v2 v3 which are already present in the starting in the initial phase because a3 is nothing but some projection of a3 on uh, times v1 and some projection times v2 while here A3 is some projection times A1 plus some projection or component times A2 uh, and this this part we subtract from the previous ones okay V3 minus and here we subtract and normalize it here we subtract these projections by from V3 and also normalize it so this is the way it is working here we need A2 and A3 beforehand and here we don't it is parallel but it introduces introduces rounding errors it is iterative it cannot be done parallelly not parallel but it is it is less error prone And that's why we call this stable method. Uh, we we call this a stable, and this is unstable way of gram field orthogonalization. So now let us try to calculate the number of flops. Number of flops means that any multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, or something, anything that happens, we consider as a single flop.
and also the order so this epc then uh, the loop of it for loop for i is equal to something something if you write the code then uh, you will see that order is actually n square by 2 because we have two for loops one for loop goes from i is equal to 1 to n and other for loop goes from uh, i plus 1 to n so whenever such structures come we call uh, we it is like double integration sort of double summation means double integration so double integration means we get x square by 2 and here we get n square by 2 so in that sense also order will get equal to n square by 2 and if you see the number of addition subtractions and all that which is happening then it will be 4m approximately 4m m is what is m m cross n c m cross n all. so 4m times n square by 2 which will be equal to 2 m n square so this is number of flops this is the order uh, and with constant some multiple but n is let us consider just the n s variable if n is variable then it is n square by 2 and if m is also variable then it will be some order of m n square this is if i consider i assume m s constant and this is when m is also variable okay so now we have understood what is uh, how this whole this process works so but often the most reliable the best way the best um, approximation of the order is order of m n square okay and we actually uh, some textbooks refer it as 2 m n square but uh, uh, let us forget all this constants and all those stuff let us just not think about it but its order is m n square let us move on now we have studied gram schmidt orthogonalization we have studied qr and now in next lecture we will be moving on to what we call it as householders method and move on to least square problems and all those so but now let us find up things for now